Hello and uh, welcome to BIMSTORM Oklahoma City Session B. This is Kimon Onuma from Onuma Inc. We are having a few guests with us today uh, this afternoon. Uh, Jason Reese, who I'll introduce in a, a minute here from Balfour Beatty Construction, is online with us. Um, Fineth uh, Jernigan, who is on the ground in Oklahoma City helping to coordinate the, BIM, the live BIMSTORM events uh, at the uh, University of Oklahoma. Uh, Lee Fithian and uh, Tammy McEwen from uh, the University of Oklahoma. Is anybody else online from Oklahoma? Lee or Tammy or Fineth, are you on? Okay, we'll wait for them to get on, but we can go ahead and start doing some intro material as we wait for them to get on. And Amber, uh, from uh, Onuma is actually online too, helping to facilitate this uh, webinar. So Amber, if you hear, uh, we do have Lee online. Okay, great. And maybe uh, if they don't have, if they have anything to say, we can let them uh, jump in. Uh, but maybe I'll just do a quick intro. We had a session this morning, um, doing, going through some of the uh, the process and the workflows. We're starting to see some projects coming in from participants. Uh, we showed some from Ryan Williams earlier today. And we're actually interacting with some of the teams online, at, uh, helping them, uh, guiding them towards getting more data into the models. Amy Shell from um, uh, Amy Shell's project, also with a lot of great background material posted. Uh, uh, including, actually, we just did this just a few minutes ago. We noticed that there was a Microsoft Project Schedule file attached to the project. We went ahead and imported the Microsoft Project Schedule into a, it's a free tool online called Ganter that can import MS Project uh, files. So you can actually see a project timeline that Amy, Amy put together. We haven't looked at this in detail, but we just noticed this. And there was a lot of background material that Amy also produced um, as far as the process and the design uh, workflows that she's been going through. Um, we also had a team, uh, projects from Kelsey we showed earlier today, and we also uh, looked at some of the background material that was posted by Kelsey on some of the studies uh, of the site. And we also had another project that just came in from Katie Craig. Um, we haven't downloaded or looked at all the material yet, but it's, it's uh, live online. And so we're encouraging all the other participants to start opening up and posting images like this, uh, live links to the project files, sending BIM mails to us to know, let, let us know when they're ready to actually be presented. Um, so we'll be continuing on through today's session, uh, preparing the material. And as we um, outlined earlier today, uh, we also are going to be heading towards presenting on Friday at the um, Oklahoma City Planning Department. So that's happening um, uh, later on um, this week. So online with us is um, Jason Reese from Balfour Beatty Construction. I'll let Jason show his screen in a, in a few minutes here and let himself let him let him introduce himself and his team. Uh, Balfour Beatty Construction has been very involved with uh, a lot of the BIM storms that have been going on for the last several years, including sponsoring several of them in Washington D.C. They jumped into the Construction Owners Association um, BIM storm last week uh, that happened in Orlando and uh, worked with a project uh, that he'll be showing today. Uh, it was a clinic model, a, a healthcare facility, uh, programming, planning, cost estimating, energy analysis, all kind of stuff was happening around this project. And it also has a COBE formatted data construction operation building information exchange. So thinking about how, as you're going through the early phases of design of a project, from an owner's requirement perspective, how does that data make its way through all the way design and construction and into operation? And obviously, as you're going through design and construction, you're producing a lot of data. What do you do with that? How does it go into operations and to the life cycle, uh, which is critical to have good information to be able to manage the facility in an efficient way? Um, so Jason, do you want to, uh, actually Amber, is there anybody else online or should we just jump to Jason for a while and then maybe come back to Fineth or Lee unless they're ready to say anything? Lee is online. Um, 
Uh, I do not see Finanth yet. Okay. All right. Well, I could try and, and contact Finanth as Jason starts up. Maybe we'll go ahead with Jason. Um, Jason, okay. do you want to show your screen? Are you ready to go? We're keeping this kind of interactive. To this uh, this particular session is a working session where we're, we have teams on the ground, at, at the students and other professionals at the uh, University of Oklahoma um, working on these projects. So there's things happening in the background. Uh, and then we're going to start seeing projects being shared, and uh, Jason is uh, going to come up next and show us what he's been working on and have a little dialogue about what his thoughts are on the process. So, Jason, are you ready? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, good. Um, let me show my screen. All right, can you see my screen? Is my screen yes. visible? Yes, yes. Okay. yes. We do. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, well, my name is Jason Reese, uh, and I work for Balfour Construction. I head our technology and process development group out of the Fairfax office, and we look at a lot of things. Uh, one of the things that uh, we really like doing is the Vim Storm. Uh, we like to do it once or twice a year, uh, mainly because it's a uh, it's a great it's a great playground uh, sandbox for us to try out new ideas, figure out better ways and more efficient ways to work. Uh, and every every year that we participate in the BIM storm, we get better and better at doing something and the con and we, we grow our concept and our capabilities. So what I'm going to show you here is actually um, I'm going to kind of run through the evolution of a concept, how it started off, and it's, it's a culmination of the past three years of really working with BIM storms and being able to uh, take advantage of uh, rapid uh, reaction to uh, different uh, challenges that we put against ourselves. So this is uh, what we're calling a, a rapid design prototyping. So just to orient everybody to what we're talking about in the manufacturing industry, uh, the what you see is that they will actually take CAD models or various uh, models and they will uh, fabricate a fake version of it. It'll, it'll be little pieces of paper glued together essentially but by a machine or you know shaved up bits of wood or something like that. Basically they make a prototype because they know that the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, probably the first dozen times, when they manufacture that widget, they're going to get it wrong. And you know, one widget fits into another widget, and how they all work together is very, very important. And they don't want to go through the fabrication process that's more uh, time-consuming and uh, expensive in order just to find out things don't work. So they expect to fail uh, regularly and work out the details until they figure until they get something that works. Well, what we want to do is because we're building buildings and every time a building is built, it's custom. We can't build 25 buildings and then decide, all right, now we're going to go build the real one now that we've tried it 25 times. It doesn't really work that way. So uh, what we're trying to do is take the whole process of building a custom building, and if we're able to quickly develop information that we're able to make better decisions and anticipate uh, and trend better results, then uh, we have more data, which is going to equal better decisions, which means we're going to get better results out of our efforts. So what does that mean? So over the years, we participated in the BIM storms. You probably recognize some of the geometry you see here. Uh, this is from the Enuma system from a couple of years ago. Uh, we've generated a lot of buildings. Uh, we masked it a few different ways. We looked at you know road construction. We looked at extracting O and M information, cost data, uh, schedule information over a two-day period with teams of 12 to 15 people, uh, all working simultaneously and uh, trying rapidly developing these concepts. Uh, and, some, and then one year we started looking at energy. So we were able to look at one scheme and say, all right, here's the... This is the Balfour Beatty. Yes. Uh, we're able to look yeah. at uh, one scheme here. It was called, this is version 7 of it, and we were able to run it through Ecotect or other uh, energy analysis software, and we were able to say, okay, here's the energy information you know, that came out of it. And we're able to do another iteration of it and try and reduce that energy impact by changing how you're able to better leverage uh, uh, photovoltaics. So the way that this works is that we look at it one way, then we look at it another way. Uh, we, don't we don't develop the scheme further than we have to in order to get the very high-level energy analysis, and we have a comparative analysis that we get. So over several iterations, 
we've basic we could basically reduce the uh, we've uh, reduced the energy consumption uh, and also uh, what is produced so we get some data back on it but what we were really doing over all this time is that we were going in this kind of circular loop around making a decision and then press processing the data further, then doing energy analysis and then doing cost analysis and everything was dependent. This is a straight line. It just kind of circles on itself and eventually you just have to stop doing work and it, it just you're just done. This is what a traditional design process, a design, you know, the design space is out in the industry. Um, we're trying to get away from this. We're trying to move something that's a lot more parallel in nature. So we started looking at the next year. It's like, okay, how do we take not just one scheme? How do we take three completely different buildings? How do we run it through uh, these different energy analyses? You know, each one, and then be able to run those same three options through uh, a cost database. In this case, we used Vico to be able to get uh, information on energy cost schedule and be able to compare three completely different schemes simultaneously to each other. So this is how we were able to start getting away from that spiral and moving a little bit more towards something that's parallel, which is what we're calling set-based design. So this is if the spiral is how we traditionally work, make a decision, then someone else makes a decision, and we just pass off information, and everyone is dependent on everyone finishing their work uh, at the, I don't know, before they can start theirs. This is a concept where we keep options open. We don't make a decision into the last most responsible point. And in order to do that, we have to be able to do a very rapid. We have to have more information to know that we are allowed. When are we? How, when is the least responsible point we're allowed to make that decision? So now we started moving a little bit more towards this uh, set-based design concept. And what that looks like in, in the forms of design process is, is what this uh, graph is showing here. So on a real simple scale, if you just take a building and you have three different roofing systems for it, and then for each roofing system you have three different types of insulation, and for and then you also have two different types of glazing that you can put on the building, you've created about 18 unique buildings that have their own energy performance, that have their own uh, cost and schedule, and uh, they bit and. There is somewhere in um, amongst all these 18 options the right choice for based on what the client values. So we have to have tools in place that you now what is this lower right hand corner one here that basically says, all right, this is what our client finds valuable, uh, so that we can go through and say, well, maybe this is the cheapest option down here of all my choices, but it doesn't get me the value that I want out of the design. The, the one, the cost that reflects the value that I like is really up here maybe, or maybe it's way up here, and that is just fine. So how do we get, how do we look at these sets? We have 18 sets just based on uh, two different decisions that we have to make, and you make hundreds of decisions on a building at a time. So uh, this set-based design is a combination of all these different theories. So the way we're coming up with uh, leveraging BIMSTORM for this is that we can do a rapid energy analysis, kind of showed you that a little bit from one of our schemes, uh, being able to uh, do that rapidly, and we can do a rapid cost analysis. Uh, those two, and, we, and we can do that with the same model. So we can take a model from Enuma, from Revit, whatever. We can run it through two different uh, programs, and then we can get a result out of that. Well, when we combine those together, that's what we're called rapid prototyping. Uh, so, and there's no one software out on the market that will do all this for you today. It just doesn't exist. So we have to find a, find ways of not only doing this rapidly, but also being able to combine our data. So for this BIM storm uh, or the uh, the COA BIM storm, we went through and our challenge was to BIMSTORM 96 design sets in only three days. So not one or not three, but 96. Uh, so we focused uh, very heavily on the process of how could we possibly do this. So in the first day we created three design uh, options in Enuma and we established our five variables. In day two we ran separate energy analysis, separate cost analysis. In day three we consolidated the data and created reports. And for those of you that are into math, that's an exponential growth times three. So that's how we get to 96 different sets. Uh, this is the tools that we use in order to do this process. Uh, Anuma uh, to create blocking and stacking. Uh, we also use we can also use a little bit of SketchUp for uh, some of the same process. Revit, where we did some cleanup uh, coming from different softwares and getting it into Autodesk Vasari. 
and then uh, being it that's what we use for our energy analysis and then we also sent the same models from Revit into Vico and then sent the results from those analyses out to Excel so what that really looks like uh, for our what we did is here's our three schemes uh, these are not complicated we didn't spend any time uh, locating windows or anything fancy we stayed at a very high level and as a matter of fact this is a grand total of three masses three blocks uh, that uh, came, came out of uh, basically slabs that came out of Enuma. This doesn't even uh, reflect the spaces that are there because we really just wanted to put an analysis on the overall building. And that's three of them that are very you can you can model something like this in SketchUp in five minutes probably you know ten minutes twenty minutes. So very simple models. Uh, these are the variables we looked at. Uh, for roof, we had two different uh, roof installations, sunshade, yes or no, glass 40% or 60%, uh, high efficiency glass or tinted glass, and exterior wall, do we have uh, like a normal insulation or we have a high insulation? And this is the data we expected to get out of the two analysis, with the yellow being the cost analysis and the blue being the energy data. So the, doing the rapid energy analysis, we went from Anuma to Revit to Vasari, and then that the data from sorry to Excel, and there's a manual extraction going from one from from sorry to Excel. That's okay. Uh, then the rapid cost analysis is going from a new one to Revit to Vico to Excel. And one of the unique things that we were able to do in Vico, and it's, it's a little bit hard to tell here, but over in the lower left-hand corner here, you can. Actually So we went through and changed one of these every single time, did the same thing for the cost analysis, although the cost analysis took a little bit harder. Uh, it was a little bit harder to do. So the results that we got, and this is, I think this is an important uh, point to make when you're talking about energy analysis, it's, is that it's not important that the energy analysis be exactly what the building is going to use because we're trying to make decisions based on different options. So for those of you that need to go back to high school with me here, uh, I went through and looked up on, on, on Wikipedia to make sure I remembered it correctly, but you know, I, if you were to take a target and you were to hit the bullseye, this is, it would be precise and accurate. If you were to go through and uh, you were to kind of get around the bullseye there, but not exactly group them together, you'd be accurate but not precise. And if you were to just have a nice tight cluster, but you would just miss the bullseye, um, then you would be precise and not accurate. Precise and not accurate is what we're trying to be with energy analysis, because we only care that we use the same variables for calculating the energy analysis and that we change one variable at a time. In, so we change glass from high efficiency to low efficiency. We change roof from high insulation to low insulation and we run the analysis using the same exact variables other than that. So it doesn't matter if the building's actually using uh, $1.2 million worth of energy over its life or $1.8 million. That, that, you know, that's the center here. We only care about the results being accurate comparative to each other so that we can make better decisions. So running all those analyses, we were able to go through and get all this data. And if anyone just looked at a chart like this, this actually is pretty meaningless. You can go through and do some very low level comparison about life cycle energy cost of different options. But this is 18, you're just looking at 18 out of 32 uh, sets for the first option. So there were three of these. Uh, and then this is just us aggregating the data in Excel. Uh, and you notice that this uh, report name here, this report name was how we made sure we had the same data in both sets. And then we're starting to analyze the data sets of the three different options. So we had scheme A, B, and we had the original scheme that we took out of uh, the Enuma system. And you can actually see them plotted here of first cost, which is what it cost to, to, to build the project, and then life cycle energy cost, which is what it takes to operate the facility, how much energy is going to use over its lifetime. And you can see they're clearly divided into you know, some clear areas here with the original scheme being uh, lower, but not substantially lower than the scheme A. But scheme B had three floors and for some reason it ended up being a lot more expensive and the life cycle energy cost was a lot higher. 
So if our goal was to reduce energy consumption in this facility, then we would throw this option out uh, from consideration. But if the owner really wanted a three-story building, we could plot this and say, hey, here's your three-story building, but guess what? There are more efficient options for you to reduce your life cycle energy cost and the initial cost. Do you, does this matter more to you now that you know that those options are out there? Those are discussions we can have. Uh, then we can do uh, a carbon analysis and end up being a little bit the same. But now you can start drilling down into an individual scheme. So if we decided that we we're going to pick scheme A, we can start looking at the effect of the design cost and life cycle energy cost when we are change the glazing from tinted glazing to high performance glazing. And what this is telling you is a lot of things, which is you know not just that there's no convergence, there's no the data is separated, but the separation is that if you want a high performing, if you want uh, energy reduction, you definitely need to get the high performance glazing. There's really no way, there's no combination of any of the sets that we looked at that really performed uh, well with the tinted glazing. However, since the cost uh, of doing the glazing is so, it doesn't converge in any one area. You can there's it doesn't really the main impact on the cost of the building is not related to the glazing. So agonizing over whether or not to uh, go with high performance glazing related to energy performance, you should just probably just go with high performance glazing here because there are other factors that are driving the energy performance that are not related to how high performing your glazing is. And then you can start looking at things like, all right, well, I have 40% glass or 6% glass. I am, as my client, I want to improve my daylighting. So I want a 60% glass on my building if that's possible. So it, I can look at the the lowest uh, the lowest life total life cycle cost of going with 60% glass against the options we looked at is this set right here. So I'm probably going to start diving into the details of what were the other options that selected that got me these four sets because I don't want to be over here and I probably don't really want to be up here. But these four sets look pretty good and I can start looking at those. And then you can start looking into individual ones like I just said and you can say, all right, if I take an ex one scheme, what happens when I apply high performance glazing? Well, it reduces the life cycle energy of the building, and it only costs about twenty thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars, something like that. So that's a this is a this is a low hanging fruit for this building is applying that high performance glazing. However, if I look at glass percentage, uh, going from forty percent to sixty percent, it really raises my life cycle cost, and it actually has a fairly it has a more substantial impact on cost. And the sunshade. You know, didn't reduce our energy consumption almost at all. So this might be a factor of the fact that the building was in San Francisco uh, and there's a lot of cloudy days, so therefore sunshades really don't do a lot. Uh, we have to look into that a little bit further, but it's a high cost and low value, so we probably wouldn't elect that option. And what all this really means comes down to time, you know, how successful were we in doing this? So it took about 600 minutes to do one scheme, and then because there's some efficiency gain from the setup, it takes about 480 minutes or about eight hours for the second and third scheme. So in about 26 man hours, we are able to come up with 96 unique buildings and be able to uh, look at data to be able to help us better inform making uh, make better design decisions. So what we so what we have here is essentially we could have three people working concurrently in one day come up with 96 different options for this building, and that's a really powerful way to look at it when you consider that if you go through a normal design process you're lucky to be able to look at three different options uh, for any given design process. Now you're looking at 96 different sets and it's a lot more powerful. You can make better decisions based on better data. So, and I think that's all I have. Yep, that's the end of my presentation. Great, thanks Jason. And we can actually show the, oops, can you hear me? Yep, thanks Jason. And we could actually show the result of that building being placed in Oklahoma City in a, in a few minutes here as well from our side. Um, do you have a few minutes to stay on for kind of a question and answer and discussion, Jason? Are you all right? Certainly. Yeah, Great. I can stay on. Great. Um, I think Fineth is online as well, too. Uh, Fineth, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Jason. Yeah, hi, Jason. Hi, Fineth. How's it going? I'm good. I'm good. Appreciate you uh, stepping in today. We've got some uh, construction companies and uh, developers uh, hooked in with this and figured that um, your experience might be valuable for them understanding, you know, kind of the big picture on this stuff. 
Yeah, so one one thing yeah. that uh, we've seen, uh, Jason, with the Balfour Beatty work, and it's... Hey, come on, yeah. come on, we'll just interrupt. Can you crank your volume up? Um, I've, I've had some reports that they're having a real hard time hearing you. You're, yeah, you're I'm, just I'm a little too soft. The, can my you... room's a little bit noisy here because I'm not in my normal location, but let me try. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay, I'll try Thanks. to speak louder. Um, so... Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, and finally, you said that we have somebody else here that you'd like to introduce, uh, Brandon Milland from the... Yeah, we've, yeah, Bra yeah Brandon um, from the uh, Oklahoma City Planning Office is online as a presenter here this afternoon. And okay. I think, Brand I think Brandon wanted to uh, maybe uh, interject some stuff. Brandon, are you there? Brandon uh, is on... Hello, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, hi, Brandon. Yeah, hi. yeah. Didn't want to put you on the spot, but um, you know, since you're on, um, wanted to make sure you had an opportunity to uh, to talk if you you felt like there's something needed that you've been seeing that you know it's worth commenting on. And yeah, we're just uh, I'm here with uh, the Oklahoma City Planning Director Russell Klaus, uh, intern Cassie Malone, uh, AJ Kirkpatrick with Downtown Oklahoma City Inc. And uh, one of our comprehensive planners, Philip Walters. So we're just really uh, happy to be part of this and looking forward to uh, to the rest of the webinar. And uh, and we're happy for the opportunity to interject uh, uh, when necessary. Well, that's great. Yeah, that's um, glad everybody's there. Um, hope you're getting some valuable uh, input from this. And I don't know whether you've had a chance to start working on anything on your own, but. Uh, I think everybody's getting pretty excited down here about you know what's going to come out for Friday. Uh, so are we. I mean, we've been looking at all the different projects that have been uploaded, and uh, a few of us are probably going to have the opportunity to come down this evening and be a part of the uh, the further developments of the designs and uh, uh, and just seeing you know being a part of the the development of, of the charrette and uh, and the ongoing process. So uh, I just think this is really great. We're just get, really getting excited by what we're seeing. That's very cool. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you uh, glad everything's working out up there. And you know, just uh, feel free to jump in if you you hear or see something that um, you know you need clarification on or or want to comment on. Um, hey, come on. Do you want to? I know you wanted to sort of ask uh, Jason a few questions about you know some of the stuff they've been doing. And you know, I guess you know that you know there's some con there's some construction students here and some some uh, industry partners who are really construction oriented um, you know you want to you and Brandon or you and Jason I mean want to um, sort of tap, touch a few other points maybe sure there's a couple of themes going on here that are pretty interesting and yes the fact that there are construction students and design students uh, there as well as the professionals that are have jumped into the process including I heard Jay Dunn Austin commercial I best I believe in Manhattan um, and a few others online. Um, but one theme here, obviously, where we have this kind of a, a city level view of a kind of a master planning project, the quarter shore, and what's Oklahoma City going to look like kind of at the planning level. And then we're drilling down to individual buildings like what Jason showed a few minutes ago. Um, and a lot of the student work that's happening as well, too. And one interesting theme here is that as we're, and I'm an architect as well, so I, I know that from the way that we've been uh, um, trained at, at school as well, too, is we, we tend to kind of look at it from the design angle of a building or a project or a city. But as we're doing going through the design process, if we can interact uh, in this kind of integrated way with teams like Balfour Beatty, that brings kind of a multidisciplinary approach to let's study uh, energy, like Jason showed, as we're going through 96 variations of the design. Well, from an energy perspective, there are certain things we have to look at. There are certain buildings, like in that scatter chart that, Jason, you showed make more sense to do. And if we flip it completely in the opposite direction, then we could say, okay, if we place this building in the city in this location, does it work from a master planning perspective? And this, this, it's this constant back and forth that typically goes on in a project. But what we're doing in BIM storms is we're trying to break that linear approach to starting in one place and continuing down the line and only having three options in the end, for example, like what Jason mentioned, if we have 96 options, and it actually multiplies even further than that as you start looking at variations of that. Um, Jason, maybe it would be interesting to hear, Jason, from your perspective, uh, how, how has that been? There's obviously a, a technical challenge to make things happen. You know, As you said, there's a lot of different tools that need to talk to each other. 
And my belief also is that as we move along, it's not going to end up being in one or two tools. There's going to be a lot of different applications that do need to talk to each other. So one part is a technical challenge. The other part is the cultural challenge that the industry is used to working in certain ways. So, for example, we're used to designing a building and handing it off to the contractor once we finish our design, and the builder gives us a bid on it, and uh, that's kind of the end of it. There's no chance to kind of adjust things. But I've seen in the interactions with you and in the BIM storm with Balfour Beatty that it opens up all kinds of design opportunities to be able to get very early input from many different directions that actually, in the end, produce a better design and also hit that target that you were showing, whether it's energy or cost or whatever. It'd be interesting to hear that and maybe have a little discussion about that, about the, the challenges of the technology and the culture and just contracting and the way the industry is. What, what do you see happening? Well, related to the uh, challenges in the technology, um, ex exchanging models and exchanging information has always been one of the challenges, uh, whereas, uh, you know, now, I can build something in Revit, but if somebody can't use my Revit model for doing, you know, a cost analysis or something like that, then they have to build their own, then it's really an inefficiency we're breeding into the industry. So we have these great tools, and one of the things that we've adopted uh, as much as we can is robust planning around how we use the tools so that we can create efficiencies rather than inefficiencies. And I think that's one that's something that a lot of uh, perspective that people lose in uh, when you're when you're starting to innovate is whether or not the you know the innovation that you're putting in place really is providing value in the terms of you know cost savings or time savings or uh, a, a better product. So, uh, you know, when we start looking at doing something like a BIM storm, one of the one of the places we spend a lot of time is not in necessarily doing the work; it's figuring out how we can exchange the information effectively. So that is a, is a critical part of you know any you know, not even not even a BIM storm, but you know just you know interacting between contractors and designers, and uh, more and more people coming up to speed on that. So it's actually been very encouraging to see people ask, well, what, what format do you need? What data do you need? What format do you need it in? Um, we get we get more and more of that, and there's still there's still people that are like, well, I'm just producing design documents, and you know, I'll give it to you, but you know I I'm not warranting that it's good for anything. So there's a little bit of a mixed bag in the industry right now, and the more successful uh, BIM uh, and technology applications that we find, the, the projects that are actually showing uh, that we get reports back and then say, I wouldn't do design and construction any other way than what I did on this project are the ones that put the effort in up front to plan how they're going to uh, exchange data and making sure that it works along the way. So. From that perspective, uh, it, we're we're seeing progress, but it's uh, not going to be rapid. Right. And I found your 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 diagram with the targets very interesting because you could almost replace. The, tell me if I'm wrong here, but uh, the uh, analysis of energy is one target, obviously, but there's also the target of cost and other factors in a design mm -hmm. project. Would you say that it's a similar approach if you're dealing with cost estimating? On a project, as an owner says, well, I have this many millions of dollars to spend. What can you do for us? Um, if you're getting in on the early part of the process and having a target that you're trying to hit, but you're also trying to compare different schemes, uh, like you showed on your, your charts as well, too. Can you talk a little bit about that? And how would one, because there's been s several discussions going on this week and also last week at the previous BIM storm relating to cost that, or an energy analysis that you, you're not hitting the exact number in the beginning, uh, you might be off by quite a bit, but if you can compare one scheme to the next, it gives you a, the ability to compare what are the pluses and minuses of each one and adjust the, uh, the, traje the trajectory of the which way the project is going. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, you know, our, our uh, more traditional pro pro process is, you know, a designer does a little bit of work, they give it to us, and then we give them a budget update. And we say, all right, well, you increase the glass here, and we didn't, now we have more information, and the assumption that I made the first time when I gave you a number, it's no longer true, so the cost went up, cost went down. It's that very linear uh, process kind of spirals in on itself that culminates with a complete set of design documents, which is all of the information that we need in order to price the project. And the problem that we have is that we're being asked to 
have better price assurance with much less information. Just, so to me. take a schematic design and to say, uh, all right, within a reasonable degree of assurance, to to when we go through the rest of the process, we're able to make sure that we're going to hit the target. So it's about being predictive with our cost, um, with our cost estimates, rather than being reactive, which is what's been very traditional. So instead of reacting to what the design is, how do we design in a way that helps us make a decision. So in, in this case with what we, you know, what I, sh what I showed with the, the different schemes and the 96 options, it's that we can look at this and say, all right, when we're making a decision to go with 40% glass or 60% glass, we know how it affects energy, we know how it affects schedule, we know how it affects cost. And we don't know what the cost of that's going to be at all but we know that compared to the other options we're looking at, it's going to be less or it's going to be more and we're making a conscious system for that option to be more. And that is where the value part of the equation comes in, in into place because if you're, we're going to increase the cost of the project to go with one option, we're doing it based on good data rather than, well, we think that if we go with 60% glass, we're going to get more daylighting. No, it's part of our process. We're going to make sure that we evaluate our different, our current sets against, you know, proper daylighting analysis in a different type of energy analysis than I, what I showed. Right. But that comparative uh, ability to make uh, uh, decisions based on more data is really what we're, you know, it's trending our costs rather than reacting to what we're given. Right. And so that, that simple model that you had in the beginning that uh, showed that you just had a, a few blocks to start doing some energy analysis, it's not necessarily going to be the final answer, but it, it lets you start down that trajectory. So if you do an energy analysis with a simple model versus if you have a more complex model further down the line of the project or another tool is doing the analysis, it probably is going to come up with, with different res results but you can constantly adjust as you go along and you have the the engineers and the designers and experts kind of involved in the process to be able to react to that. Um, that's my Right, so the, the process of going through and doing an energy analysis, once you have all the information, you have a complete design and you're checking to see, you know, uh, how much energy the building is going to use, you use a completely different tool than what we use, which is Vissari. Right. I use an, an IES or something like that, and you get you get a much you get a more accurate number, mm -hmm. but you can't go back and make any changes to all the decisions that you made in the process. You're left with what you have. Right. So if we made if we made ten key decisions that all drove the energy down by looking at energy at many points in that rapid process then we've assured that we've made all the the, reasonable, the the most responsible decisions to make sure that the building is going to perform as, as efficiently as possible. We don't know how much energy it's going to consume, but we know we made decisions that are going to drive it down. And whatever it ends up being, it ends up being, but we know we didn't end in a place we don't. We know we're going to get as close as we possibly could to our target. Right. Very important point, I think. And uh, one that in the BIM storms, we've been describing these as, as train wrecks. We create train wrecks and look for options and look for things that are going to cause problems and hope to catch them earlier in the process rather than later when it's too late to change things. And that's been a, been a pretty much uh, proven uh, discussion even in the other parts of the building information modeling process as far as a project goes. But now at this scale, when we're looking at a BIM storm, and uh, actually, we're looking at the screen where your three different dental clinics, or medical clinics that you designed, we brought into the Oklahoma City planning model. And you had initially placed it, I think, I believe, out here in uh, what we were proposing to be possibly a urban campus or a community college. And then we had one other site that we located here uh, on the uh, edge of the, uh, the new development of the Coeur de Shore area. Um, but these little blocks here essentially are representations of the studies that you already did in more detail. So now I, from a planning perspective, if I jump back up to the city planning level, now we can actually take those blocks that you have more detailed design and keep on refining it. So we'd say we move it here and we've actually possibly rotated at five degrees or whatever that might be. That actually triggers other energy analysis options, obviously. Um, so that kind of back and forth is kind of interesting. Um, Fineth, are, are you there? Do you want to say a few words relating to this discussion, or are there any questions from Tammy and Lee's um, class there? Um, well, yeah, well, come on, I'm here, and um, the uh, the only thing I'd say is that you know, from the community standpoint, um, 
we're once it's once it's to the level that you're showing on the screen, we also um, we start getting the ability to roll these up and look at them in a sort of an urban scale kind of basis rather than looking at them as isolated buildings. Right. And um, you know I know that's not totally connected to what Jason you know Jason's really talking more in the you know detailed decision about you know clinic A versus B or C. But you know when you start looking at this from a big picture standpoint, now you can start connecting all that to the kind of the urban scale decisions. Right. And it, it you know it's kind of one of the this is you know starting of an era where rather than you know the contractor working off on their own and you know responding to what the designer and the owner wants in in isolation, now we're we're talking about. You know, even up, even rolled up to that larger uh, urban scale, all these things are connecting. Right. You want, I would want everybody involved as early as possible, even if it's just to kind of touch the project and be giving some input, say, from our experience, well, here are some things you should consider, or even d diving down into a, a charrette, like what a workshop, like a BIM storm like what uh, Jason described with the 96 schemes. I mean, the, doing that in a few days is incredibly valuable because then you can run through the different train wrecks as we talked about um, to see what, what options we have. Right. So, yeah. Right, and, and you know, the, the, you could make the decision on one of these medical clinics, plop it in here, look at it in relationship to the whole neighborhood, right. and suddenly start, you know, it may actually change the whole decision point. Exactly, yes. So, um, okay. I was actually going to do a few more things here, but Ryan's project, we have a question. There's a raised hand. Uh, there's a question coming from the audience. Uh, Amber, was there a question coming in from the audience or somebody online? Uh, we just have a raised hand. Would you like me to unmute yes, them? Yes, please do. We want to keep this somewhat interactive, so whoever has a question, please, okay. please jump in. Okay. Um, it's... Uh, Matthew McLarty. Welcome, Matthew. Oh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, thank you. We can't hear you. No, there, there is no question. There's no question? Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. No, no, no. There was no question. I must have accidentally hit something. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Um, okay. Fine. from your side, uh, it, it'd be interesting to hear from... Um, some of the um, uh, the projects that we kind of quickly went through earlier, the one from from Ryan and um, and Kelsey and uh, uh, Amy, and uh, there, there were four projects that we've seen so far. We're expecting to see more as this, as these students that are participating in this are, start jumping in. There's some really interesting uh, results coming in from some of these projects. I mean, there's some some pretty amazing images and and uh, workflows that we, we were starting to see, which is great. We're seeing some of the background of, for example, how, how Amy uh, uh, worked on the, uh, the analysis of uh, uh, the color uh, analysis from a, a painting here for the building that she's working on, some of the cost estimating. It's not very clear how the different groups are collaborating yet. We, we heard that uh, uh, Austin Commercial and J. Dunn and Manhattan are involved in some way with these projects. It'd be interesting to hear if there's any input from anybody in the audience there as far as what's going on there, uh, what's happening. Uh, does anybody? Can anybody yeah. jump in on that? Well, come on, one. Yeah, hopefully there'll be somebody, some of those, those people jumping in here, and and you know everybody uh, feel free to you know either raise your hand or post a question, and we'll get you into this discussion. But come on, one of the things that's happening that I think ever everybody needs to understand is there are a lot of there are actually a lot of different workflows uh, occurring here right mm -hmm. now, and um, what's happening because of that, um, you know, I'm I'm kind of running around, and I think others are running around, you know, trying sort of fighting fires because not all of the workflows are. Um, Within the, within the system, within kind of this BIM storm framework, are clean and and straightforward, mm -hmm. and so we're having a little bit. There's there's some hiccups, mm -hmm. um, you know, things that, you know, thing things that probably have never been tried before, literally, that um, that maybe don't work as well as they should, but we're we're you know everybody seems to be you know good cheer and uh, working around them, but it's. Um, 
you know, I think part of the reason you haven't seen anything is some of the some of the people who are trying to do real world things for the first time, you know, that it's sort of figuring out the workflow to in this environment right. is more in a notion. That that's not a new scenario or, or symptom, I don't think. Right. Um so that's going on. The other the other piece that's going on is I have noticed that some of the projects we showed earlier, uh people are now talking about um about you know adding data, putting adding in custom attributes or you know you know categorizing their projects so I think we'll be able to see uh, more um, you know more analysis and stuff on these things as time goes on um, right and which I think is really cool it's I mean we're starting to get that now one of the things could I can I actually do you have the your bimstorm OKC results matrix up? Uh, not yet I thought I would go I you, would go over that can yeah, you pull, I can pull that, up? that up but maybe one thing before we, we jump into that um, Oh, actually, did you pull this? Somebody pulled a project in here, but this. Oh, can you hear me? Did I lose you? Hello? Oh, you couldn't hear me? Up, Kamon's created a uh, matrix here, which is, um, and on the left side, he's he's I believe listed everybody who signed up uh, for the BIM storm, and then he's created a bunch of columns that are the uh, the type of information and the types of things that we're hoping to see across projects, and um, one of the things that everybody could do to help uh, help those of us who are trying to sort out what we're going to uh, to show on Friday, and you know, we're—it's really interesting. We're starting to get so much stuff that uh, Kamon and I are moving into information overload very quickly here. Um, it would be really good if, you, to the extent you're available, you can. And Kamon, we, we're going to share this with everybody, right? We're going to share this right. list. Kamon, you still Hello. there? Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, so we're the idea is we're going to share this list yeah, with everyone. Yeah, this is a public, uh, publicly listed. Um, if you have the link, this yeah, matrix. you can share it and you you can you actually there? edit. Okay, so we're the idea is we're going to share this matrix with everyone, and um, what we hope hope to see, we, you know, Kamon started. Let's just look at Kelsey uh, Kelsey's project. Uh, Kamon started to go through. Yeah, we'll post the link for everybody. But what what we would like is we're gonna we're gonna be in the process of as we go through we're gonna start uh, filling out this about you know who's done what how you you know whether you've whether you've got a you know whether you pulled your information into a PowerPoint all those kind of good things so that we can start really talking in terms of you know the kind of work effort people have done one of the things if you're and I I know some of the students are really under the gun for for um, grade related deliverables right now I we, have, we do understand that but to the extent the extent you can help us with this to identify your the your best work the work that you really want to uh, to show by you know putting the URL in of the of the um, the scheme that you think is your best one by even even the URL within the system of, of a PowerPoint if you've put one together any of the information that's in here you can fill out about your project would be a very big help to you know to make sure that we really that you really do represent your work the best way and that we actually are you know representing you correctly um, and you know it's I appreciate come on pulling this together because we were really wrestling with how we sort of systematize this right um, let's see what else actually um, a couple of can you hear me I guess it's some you know, I know that a lot of you are really you're really jumping in and starting to look at categorizing spaces. I know uh, we had a discussion just right before we started about some of that. Yeah, I hear you. Come on. Can you hear I hear me? you. Yeah, we need yeah. to speak up. Um, okay, so so with that, um, I don't know. Is J Jason, are you still on? I am still here. Yes. Yeah, are there any other um, any other words of wisdom that you would like to uh, interject in this? That uh, any uh, anything that you know you've got a got an audience of uh, what's I guess half con uh, construction con people and half uh, half designers. Um, 
any any words of you'd like to uh, anything you haven't said that needs saying to that group uh, related to kind of finishing out the BIM storm. Arm. Well, related to finishing out the BIM storm, your experiences with uh, you know you're you're one of the people in Balfour Beatty who's responsible for making this transi transition, and um, you know it seems like you probably you know there are a lot of people in down here that are really wrestling with you know does this make sense? Why would I spend the, spend my energy on this? Um, gotcha. I think you know just your your you know kind of where you guys are coming from would I think would be valuable. Understanding that. So uh, adoption of BIM Storm into our process is really what, what boils down to us is how, do, how does it enable us to do something better? And in a lot of ways, it's taken us three years to we, – we recognize there's value in the BIM Storm process and you know, some of the tools and everything, but it's not, they're not always immediately applicable to all of our projects. So what we've been trying to do over the years is – get down to what I showed today, which is the very, we, we said, here's a very specific process we want to achieve, and we're going to use the, BIM, the, the, the best techniques we know from BIM Stormers, exchanging data, which, you know, using high level, you know, high level models and that type of thing. We learned how to do that in past BIM Storms, and now we're, and now we're going to try and, we think we can, we, can, we can achieve something that we couldn't achieve before now that we know how to do these things. So BIM Storm, it was, it, it's always been to us, we're going to try things, and we know we're going to fail. And then we're going to say, all right, well, that didn't work. Let's try it a different way. And it allows us to do that. But more than anything else when it comes to BIM Storms is that when I try and talk about them internally here as to what they are uh, and what we're trying to do, a lot of people don't really understand what I'm talking about or why they're valuable. But if I show them a a very focused process on what we were able to do like I just showed you. People get it, oh, I get that. I can use that on my next job. Uh, it's a very specific technique. Is it everything we do for BIMSTORM? No. Um, but and the other thing too is that some feedback I got from internally, internally here is that when I involved somebody that knew what BIMSTORM was, kind of said, yeah, that sounds like it's valuable. I don't really understand it when I involved them in the BIMSTORM and I, got, I just immersed them into the environment give them a few tasks or something like that, and then they saw the results, they all of a sudden came back to me and they said, ah, I get it now. I really couldn't understand it before, but now I get it. So, you know, BIM Storm and using these techniques for actually putting work in place is something you just don't get. You don't get it until you experience it. So that's one of the real values that we're getting out of participating in BIM Storm is getting more people acclimated to understanding how the complexities of exchanging information back and forth. It it takes some of the simplification out of people's mind where someone says, oh, well, I just, you know, the, the designer just gives me their, their Revit model and you can just go do a takeoff in five minutes, right? Well, that's not really true because there's a lot of data transfer problems. There's, you know, certain information. And there's, there's things that people don't understand until they, they don't necessarily have to be modelers. They don't have to be experts, but they have, if they get that little bit of experience and they start realizing the intricacies of things that you would think would be subtle are actually fairly complex uh, and you take some know-how, then then they get it and they say, all right, what's well, more it, now on my next pro project when I'm, you know, trying to ask for the Revit, for you know, the designer to do something in Revit, now I understand that it's a little bit harder than what I'm asking for or I, or I know a little bit more about how to better enable that designer to give me the deliverable that I really want because I'm more knowledgeable about uh, what's possible out there. So that's a lot of the value we get out of BIM Storms. Um, yeah. More than anything else is helping get people get acclimated to this world of BIM and how can we use it uh, uh, as effectively as possible to better enable our business. Great, great, great. Come on, are you there? Thanks, Jason. I, we appreciate that. Um, Kimon and I are having a little trouble transferring the screen here. It looks like so. Kimon, you there? He's having some audio uh, difficulties. I I think we okay. have his screen though, or yeah, are you? Per I think that might be mine. Okay, so um, I guess we're you know we're a little bit early here. Um, is there anybody, Amber? Is there anyone else online that um, that would like to say anything, or um, other Tammy? Are you, I'm are back. you there? Are Hello, you this Lee, is Kimon. By any chance? Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Our yeah, connections little, have been kind of bad. Yeah, having a little 
audio problem right. there, huh? What Jason said actually is really interesting about the um, jumping in. Barely. You can't Just hear barely. me, Earl? I'm here, fine. Yeah, okay. So, Tammy, do you um, you have any... I th it looks like we're kind of coming to the, um, you know, the downside of this, and no, you, I know everybody's very busy, so we don't want to waste anybody's time here, but do you have any... Any last, you or Lee have any last words you want to uh, interject into this? Um, I, I mean, I think. Hey, come on, hang on just a second. Well, let, let's let Tammy jump in here for a minute. Oh, I was just going to make a comment that um, I've been, you know, looking at some of the things that the students are working on with their just the student teams um, with the architecture and construction students and they're further developing and it's coming together they're working feverishly down uh, down there but also watching um, some of the progress that is being made with um, industry and, and how they're inputting different things here um, on the different schemes that I think you know it's it's coming together very nicely with some of the alternatives. It's interesting to see what objective, what you know, what goal each group has, uh, and what they're looking at, the different perspectives, and testing different ideas, and seeing what level of data and, and amount of information they can get out, and what they can do with it. So uh, it's turning into a really good experience, learning experience here. That's good. That's good. Um, I guess just um, one thing for the students, and I know, you know, our goal is not to get in the middle of you, um, of everybody uh, wrapping up what you need to do for um, Professor Fithian and Professor McEwen, but I, one of the things I, I would just, and we keep picking on the same, same students, but I guess I'm just going to pick on Ryan here for a minute again. You notice Ryan's got a, uploaded an off, a, awful lot of images and PDFs and stuff here. One of the things that, uh, if you have time, that you could do for us um, in this list, I've noticed, I think, in Amy, she has a uh, PowerPoint in here where she's uh, really, I guess, put most of her stuff into a single PowerPoint. We could, you know, when Kimon and I looked at it, we could pull up her PowerPoint and we got a really good overview. If you have time and, and you want to save yourself a little time, don't, don't go into formatting the PowerPoint, but instead of having to go through the process of you know three at a time uploading all these JPEGs and PDFs and stuff, one of the things that you might do just as a suggestion is draw just make a PowerPoint. You know it can be just a white background. Don't worry about formatting anything, and drop your best images onto that PowerPoint, and then upload that PowerPoint. We'll be as we're looking through for these, we'll be looking for PowerPoints in your attachments, because and and we're we're going to just kind of assume if we see a PowerPoint, that's what you think is your best work. Um, again, don't you know? Don't get in the middle of finishing stuff you got to finish, but just it might actually save you some time over, you know, how long it takes to upload all this all these uh, files at times. Um, Tammy, do you had something else? Oh, I was just going to comment that some of this may be just some of the teams are working ahead to some of the academic deliverables that they have as well. Yeah. So seeing um, the more detailed images and and uh, PowerPoints may be there may be an overlap there also. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, don't. We don't want to you know make extra work for anybody because we know uh, you know there are a whole group of people under the gun right now. But if you're you know, if you're wanting to get your stuff shown, you want to want to see the best inf the, your best work sort of out there, and you you know you want to just sort of get it front and center. Um, PowerPoint might save you a little time as opposed to uploading all these. You know, I'm sure if if you asked Ryan how long it took him to upload all these images and he he added it all up, it it would be a lot longer than it would have taken just to drop them all into a kind of an unstructured PowerPoint. And just upload it. So, just an option if you know if you need it. Okay. Right. So, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Oh. Okay, great. I don't know what happened with the audio. I got a different audio line here, but yeah, one, yeah, you are breaking up, come on. So, still breaking up? Yeah, not right as now? not as bad, but um, yeah, I'm. Okay. People are going to have trouble hearing you. So, speak speak up if you could. 
All right, I'll just say a couple of things and I'll, I'll finish. Um, yeah, I, I think we're seeing a lot of really exciting stuff. Uh, obviously, the students have their deadlines and their deliverables, so we we can uh, appreciate that. And uh, thanks for sharing your images in the, in the BIM Storm and attaching them to the project so we can show them here. So as you finish them, just upload them. One thing with these BIM Storms, and each one's been a little bit different. This one actually is a, a, a very interesting to see the, the dynamics of this develop. Uh, Obviously, a lot of things, like Jason said, you really have to kind of jump in and uh, work with it to, to, to try things out, see what doesn't work. Uh, and even what finance, what you were mentioning earlier, certain hiccups and things that you run into, if you run into, run into them on the day of the BIM storm, then it makes it very difficult. And that's why we, we always encourage do a test drive. You know, you can't, uh, it only way to learn how to ride a bicycle is jump on the bicycle. And that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, once you get into that, Experience, then you start a, a, the ability to collaborate with others, and everything starts expanding from there. But that's really the intent of these BIM storms: is really to mix things up, get people involved, get involved early, and try things out, even if they fail, and then move on. And uh, that's really the best way to to learn uh, about this process. Right. Yeah. Good. Good point, Kimon. And um, you know the. Um, those of you that uh, have followed some of the stuff that um, that I've put out in writing over the years, uh, you know, I've got this philosophy: fail fast and move on. You know, try it. If it doesn't work, try something else. And that's that really is what the BIM storms are all about. So, okay, um, uh, Brandon, or I, I guess the Oklahoma City Planning Office is still online. You want? You We're have any here. last words? Uh, we're just uh, looking through some of the uh, the projects that are on this uh, that have been uploaded right now. Uh, while you guys are talking, just you know, exploring yeah. every, all the work that's been done and uh, just formulating um, some feedback to give you guys. But yeah, there's looking. pretty cool stuff there, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, just uh, we're looking at all the different buildings uh, that have. Um, we're looking at a few that were down on at uh, Walker and 15th Street. Mm -hmm. uh, just seeing how those are evolving and um, you know, just looking at. Connectivity, all those uh, core um, aspects of the uh, uh, fundamental aspects of the core to shore plan. So, looking forward to see what comes uh, within the next several hours. That's great, and um, I guess just as a um, and I, I understand you're coming down and you're going to you know hopefully be able to see you for a few minutes. The um, one of the things that that you all could do to to help this is you know we're going to be putting you know this presentation together for Friday. And it would be great if um, you know you did you did kind of your cut on uh, you know what you see that you you're really enamored of. Uh, okay. Just to you know just so we you know, as we put this together the whole idea is to you know give the people doing all the work some credit and uh, yet you know show you know show what could be as well as we can and your input your input up there is really critical to this. We'll do. Okay, appreciate it. Okay, uh, any last words from anybody? Tammy, come on. Lee, anybody? I think we're good. Thanks, Jason, okay. for jumping in from Alpha Baby. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, we really do yeah. appreciate it, Jason. And yeah. thank you all for taking the time. And you know, we're going to be around for a while. So keep keep the BIM mail coming. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye.